used? Well, I believe it was uh, it was the uh, it was sophomore year. Yep. Uh, we were in the same class at Stanford, sort of the intro philosophy, uh, core, the core philosophy class, philosophy sixty, I believe. Actually, I think it was philosophy eighty. It was mind, matter, and meaning. It was Michael Bratman. Yeah, I, th I think it was philosophy sixty, but maybe yeah. it was eighty. It was Michael mm -hmm. Bratman, winter quarter, uh, 86, 87 yep. school year, and um, and I think we ended up. Yeah, we ended up spending an hour or two hours on the quad arguing about life, the universe, and everything. Yes, exactly. It was kind of the beginning of years and decades of um, more or less taking any sophisticated intellectual position that one of us had and taking the, ne the negation of it, and that was where the other person would likely be. Oh, I, don't, I don't think it's always oppositional. <laughs> yes. You know, I think it's, uh, I think we were always, we always were looking for what the truth is. Yep. Uh, we, we had, I think, two th views. That, um, we were driven by two views. One was that uh, we didn't have the full truth, mm -hmm. and secondly, that it was possible to get to the truth. And I think you always want to have that, uh, that blend between um, uh, an awareness of your ignorance on the one hand, but secondly, uh, not being complacent with that and just wallowing in your ignorance, which is the, uh, the bad way to go. And not only trying to find the truth, but actually, I think, partially those are the years where I began to formulate the theory of what the U.S. needed was more public intellectuals, yes. which is people saying what the truth could be or might be in order to shape where we should be going. And our discussions were part of that. And that, I think that was actually part of the reason we also ended up combining our campaigns running for student senate. It's always, coming back to Stanford always has such a strange feel because it seems like just yesterday and a universe away at the same time. These, univers these universities are always designed to look identical to, I guess, reassure the alumni. And it, has, it always has this very strangely reassuring and, and at the same time, uh, jarring feeling to it. Yeah, the first couple of years I came back, it, was, it felt weird because it felt like I should be participating, like I should be arguing with people, bumping into people, talking about what, uh, you know, a kind of a new class, a new theory, a new professor. And now it actually just feels like, you know, I'm visiting and I'm, I've been, you know, the, the, the so many generations have passed since we've yes. been here that it's... You know, there have been a lot of, uh, the, the one of the really cool events that we both did at Stanford together was in uh, early 2005 at, uh, tr uh, this was a speaking event at uh, Tresseter, post PayPal. Mm -hmm. You were just getting started with LinkedIn yep. uh, and, you know, the social networking movement phenomenon was just really getting started. And uh, I remember uh, there was this panel, you and myself, I believe Sean Parker was on it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of where were the next uh, great companies going to be started? And I was suggesting you know, this was a difficult search problem. Um, you know, where, where, where should you find the next mm -hmm. great startup? So it's, it's, a, it's a classic search problem. And to simplify the search, I suggest you should look within a five mile radius of, um, of Stanford. Yes, exactly. Um, in part because also the whole peninsula density of doing interesting software projects is that people move here. Like for example, Max, you know, moved from, you know, University of Illinois because uh, Max Levchin, who was yes. the, you know, Peter's co-founder with PayPal, uh, and a number of other folks move here. So you carried a density at which the possibility of the interesting companies coming out of it is within a relatively short radius. How much do you think things have changed in the years since we were here? Uh, you mean since? Uh, the late 80s. <laughs> 1990. We don't want to date ourselves precisely. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I don't, uh, I think one thing has happened is the whole blossoming of the entire entrepreneurial scene. So, I mean, it was, it was known there were startups, it was known this was a place to start things, but it wasn't something that, for example, undergraduates were particularly thinking about going, like, I'll leave university and I'll go start a company. I think that whole thread comes from how cheap it's to do a software company now, how many different successful consumer internet companies you've had, with essentially folks who are either just out of college or one or two years out of college. I think that has mammothly, you know, permeated the entire campus. Yes. I'm teaching a class on how to start companies this quarter at Stanford and mm -hmm. we had like 300 people sign up for it within the first week. So it's definitely, it's back to an intensity that I think you saw briefly in the late 90s, but it feels much more real this time. Yes, well, because the, the, the cost and the revenue model is entirely different. This is one of the reasons why people say, well, is it a bubble like Web 1.0 is a bubble? It's like, no, because actually 
the costs of running these businesses is substantially lower, the possibilities of revenue are higher. So unlike just the, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, a, a theory, it is actually, they, they can be running businesses pretty effectively.